Hello and welcome again to the 2015 Cycling Weekly Tour de France preview with me, Rebecca Charlton, and joining me today, it's Dr. Hart, Richard Abraham and Malcolm Elliott. Welcome, guys. Thanks again for being here. Now, stage 16, we're going to see a bit of a transition into the Alps and perhaps leading us into the most crucial stages of this year's tour, of course, the Alpine stages. Talk us through the stage to gap firstly. Well, the stage to gap isn't really a proper Alpine stage um, in the same mould as those final few stages. Um, it's very much a transition day, but Gap is one of the most popular stage finishes for a Tour de France. It's, it's a really, uh, it's got a lot of history to it. Um, cycling fans will remember in 2003 uh, the descent off the Col de Mons where Joseba Bilocchi crashed, broke his leg, and Armstrong had to dive round to avoid the guy on the floor, cut through the field, got off the bike, ran across the ditch, got back on and rejoined the race. It was a real classic moment of, uh, of that that year of the tour and uh, there's always something exciting happens on a, a finish into gap. Um, Chris Freeman Alberto Contador had a bit of a duel uh, a couple of years ago on, on, on a similar descent, uh, on the same descent in fact. So um, probably not quite the high mountain stage that is going to be the real fireworks from a, the overall perspective but certainly something for the GC riders to look out for. Okay, then move us on to stage 17. Are things getting more serious now? Absolutely. Uh, stage 17 takes us from Dean Leban to Pralu. Uh, a carbon copy of that was in the Criterium du Dauphino um, in June, uh, which was won by Roman Balde. Um, so it goes over the Col de Allo, which is a real big alpine climb, uh, touches almost 3,000 metres of altitude, You're going very, very high up. Fast, technical, sweeping descent, and back down to Pralu. The thing about Pralu, it's not quite a climber's climb. It's only around seven kilometres long, average of about 6%. Um, so it's got enough to really make the bigger guys hurt, but perhaps not really too severe um, that it's going to chuck a load of guys out of contention straight but it's, away. It's also where Eddie Merckx's grand tour career ended in 1975. He, got, he was at a solo break, had a gap at the bottom at Pralu, got caught in the white by Bernard Tivenet and was never really the same man again. It was, that was the famous sign about Merckx has fallen, the Bastille has fallen, mm. um, because that was uh, probably one of the biggest sea changes in that sort of, in the Grand Tour history we've ever seen, because it was, it was the end of Merckx. It was the, the unbeatable man yeah. was finally beaten on the slopes of Pralu. Uh, there was actually a memorial a couple of kilometres from the, the top, uh, remembering Bernard Tevenet's uh, exploits of overtaking Merckx and uh, going on to win that year's race. I'm sure they'll have it back out for the Tour de France, marking the exact spot. Um, so a lot of history. And this is the first time I think that the race has been back since that edition. Um, so certainly going to be a, a, a really key day. So before we go on to looking more specifically at stage 18, Malcolm, let's come to you for a minute. How important are time cuts and how much pressure is on, on those riders on the back foot at this point? Well, a, a time cut is, is what it says. It, 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 if you don't make that time cut, you go home. So it, it's absolutely important, vitally important to, to make that cut. And uh, the best way of doing that, really, the safest way, is to establish yourself in the, the gruppetto, sometimes referred to as the laughing group, uh, although not a whole lot of laughing goes on in there. Uh, and that, that group will, that gruppetto will form at a, probably a, a, some sort of loosely predetermined point along the stage there where, uh, where, where those guys will, will, will sense that, that that's the safest place to do it, that, that, that they, they will be able to make the, the time cut from that point on. And of course the pressure really will be on in these closing stages. Talk us through the next two in the way of 18 and 19. Well, stage 18 is an enormous mountain stage. It goes from Gap uh, over to Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne. Um, so it includes five categorised climbs before they go over the, uh, the, real, the real biggie on the day, the Col de Glandon. They finish with a little bit of a, a, uh, an interesting interlude just before the finish in Saint-Jean de Maurienne. So La Cé de Montvernier, it's a spectacular climb, 18 hairpins in about three kilometres. So that's 150 metres or so. Um, you're not going to be able to get to watch the tour on it, but from a spectator's point of view at home, that is going to be absolutely stunning. Uh, but a really tough day in the Alps potentially a little bit of a springboard for an attack towards the end of that stage, um, but really nothing too much to worry about, we think. Um, stage 19 uh, is a real corker. It finishes in Latu Swear, which we'll all remember from where uh, Chris Froome... Yeah. Um, Chris Froome not attacking Bradley Wiggins. Definitely did not course, attack Bradley yes. Wiggins. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a funny climb. It's not really been used in the tour too much, but um, it's obviously built up quite a, a big reputation already. 
Um, that's a day that goes uh, back over the Col du Chaussy and over the Col de la Croix de Fer, uh, which is another really big alpine climb, and it finishes on La Tussuire. Uh, it's a short day in the mountains as well, 140 odd kilometres. Uh, so it's kind of following in the mould of those really short, explosive mountain stages that, that have worked so successfully in the past. Hutch, stage 20, of course, penultimate day of this year's tour, Alp d'Huez. Tell us about why this is so historic. Well, where else? It's the, this is where the tour is going to be won this year. It's going to be Alp d'Huez. Another short stage, 109 kilometres. Very short, very punchy. It's all about it's all about the Alp, about Alpe d'Huez. There's 21 hairpins. Everybody knows there are 21 hairpins. The riders riding it count down the hairpins, which I don't think they do on any other mountain. And there will be crowds 10, 15 deep the whole way up the mountain. Um, it is an extraordinary place and an extraordinary atmosphere. Even in the Tour de France, it's extraordinary. And it's the penultimate day. It's the day before Paris. Everybody's aiming at that. Even the four days in the Alps which are big days, they're still all boiling down to, to kind of to this one mountain at the end. Malcolm, how tough is it outdoors? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's as hard as, as all of the climbs really that, uh, that go up to that sort of altitude. And when you're in the, the, the third week of a Grand Tour, uh, you, you're pretty numb and you, you, you really, uh, you, it's hard to just distinguish one from the next. But, uh, but, but what does distinguish outdoors is the, is the sheer number of spectators. And I mean, even in, term, in the context of the Tour de France, that is the one where, where everyone just descends on. And uh, uh, the, 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 the number of people on there, there's barely, barely room to get, get a car up. Uh, and the riders, they, they just, uh, it's just numbing, really. Uh, the, the ears will be ringing all the way up there. I'm sure. Thank you for joining me today, guys. Thank you for watching. Give us your predictions. It could all happen in the Alps this year. Get involved in the conversation over on Twitter using the handle at Cycling Weekly. Thanks for watching. See you next time.